This material is from Biostatistics for Biomedical Research in the Information Loss chapter. We're going to discuss problems with classification and um, what are the advantages of probabilistic thinking and this will touch on um, optimum decision making. So um, many studies um, attempt to classify patients as diseased or normal and uh, to use patient symptoms and test results to make such a classification. Uh, but given a reliable estimate of the probability of disease and the consequences uh, of um, making a, a positive diagnosis and being wrong or making a negative diagnosis and missing a disease and, and failing to treat it, um, once you understand the consequences, you can make an optimum decision that uh, maximizes uh, some um, useful criterion. The consequences of making a decision in medicine are really only known at the point of care, and it's important to note that the consequences are not known by the authors of a research paper, yet many authors uh, do uh, classification and make arbitrary decisions in their papers, and these are unfortunately taken up in clinical practice unnecessarily. Categorization can only be done at the point of care uh, when the various uh, loss or utility and costs are known. The beauty of probabilistic thinking is that continuous probabilities are self-contained and they are their own error rates. So let's consider three patients that have three different estimated probabilities of disease. A patient with a risk of disease that's estimated to be 0.03 and is treated as if the patient does not have the disease, by definition will have a 0.03 chance of being an error. A patient in the middle with a probability of disease of 0.4 that's treated as if the patient's normal and uh, so the drug or surgery isn't given, the probability of being wrong will be 0.4. A patient with uh, a higher chance of disease that is treated as if she really does have disease, the, uh, if the probability of disease is 0.75, then the chance of being wrong in treating the patient is by definition 0.25. Uh, when you try to make uh, categorizations and classifications, uh, it's as if the goal is to diagnose and treat groups of patients and not individual patients. Uh, the optimum decision for a group, if, if the concept even is well-defined, is not optimum for individuals in the group. So what are the components of optimum decisions? This is not all-inclusive, but this is many of the components. So we have uh, standard things like age, family history, smoking history, physical exam, vital signs like blood pressure, uh, specialized test results and biomarkers, uh, the sex of the patient, the blood analysis. Uh, but in addition to those things, what goes into decisions is whether there are resources available uh, to take the action that's desired uh, what does a patient want or what are the utilities for various options that are given by patients? Uh, what are the patient's preferences? Uh, some patients have religious convictions that prevent them from having certain treatments. And what are the costs of the various treatments and, and diagnostic options? Um, and so those are all the things, that not all, but that's many of the things that need to be considered when making an optimum, de optimum decision. So in a typical biomedical research paper, what does the paper concern itself with? Well, it's generally the variables in black and others, and that paper doesn't have access to resource availability and utilities and costs. So what do statistical models do? They reduce the dimension dimensionality of the problem by taking the variables in black and putting those into a model for estimating the predicted probability of an outcome or a disease or an expected blood pressure. Uh, so that is that sort of prediction is a very nice mapping of many variables into one variable. 
Uh, but the true dimensionality of the problem is still not just one variable. Variables in blue and probably others need to be taken into account. So the statistical model prediction is, is one variable. These other variables are going to remain.